All right, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you to our medication safety ongoing webinar series. This is our second one. If you've missed the first one regarding uh, opioid medication safety, it is on um, our website. And the link there will take you to YouTube where you can view the recording. Um, for this uh, portion of the series today, we are talking about um, diabetic agents and medication safety and um, recognizing uh, the, oops, I'm sorry. <sighs> recognizing the um, challenges that come with uh, medications, these medications. I'm having some trouble. There we go. Okay. Apologies for that. Um, as you may have already noticed, all of the attendees are muted and we're not using video for this um, version of our <clears throat> series. To get a good experience, we'd like you to um, join us on the computer if you can. If you're on phone only, um, you can either join through your computer or if you have a smartphone, there is a Zoom app. Um, which you can use. I've used it and it's actually fairly straightforward and easy, all things considered. Um, for our question and answer, since you are muted, we're going to use the chat feature. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions as we go along. And at the end of the series or at the end of the presentation, Dr. Class will um, answer your questions. So for those of you that may be new to Zoom, the uh, Chat icon should be located near the bottom of your screen, and um, you will want to click that, and it'll bring up the chat on either the right of your screen, or it may have a separate window of its own. And you want to select everyone, unless you need to send a private message to someone so that we can all see your message. And then you'll just enter and send your message. So as a quick test of that, let's, oops, my goodness. Uh, Let's go ahead and uh, introduce yourself by telling us what city you're in and what your expected high temperature is going to be today, if you know that. Maybe it's time to check your weather app on your phone, speaking of apps. Right here in Portland, I don't actually know what it's supposed to be today. 48, I hear. So, oh, look, see, there's Tyler. Oh, a balmy 48. <clears throat> Welcome, welcome. A couple of Portland folks. Las Cruces. Woo! Chile and Elko. Las Vegas, a balmy 60. Lovely. 34, no. Oh, okay. Well, thank you everyone for that. Um, now that you know where Chad is and you've told us a little bit about yourself, aka where you live and how warm it's going to be. Wow, even in Reading, it's only 57. It's clearly winter, finally. Um, in preparation for today, we wanted you to kind of think about what is one thing that you hope to learn during today's session. So um, again, we're talking about diabetic medications and how they can have negative effects and how we can um, prevent uh, those adverse drug events. So if you want to go ahead and answer in chat, what do you hope, what is one thing or many things if you feel the need to, that you hope to learn today. I see Laura has commented that she does uh, diabetes classes, so information that they can share in the classes. Tips for reducing hypoglycemia, that's definitely gonna be in our talk today. Titration of long-acting medications. Combination usage of medications. Uh, Audrey says, I'm looking for ways to educate residents with anxieties about their insulin levels and how to better manage those. Excellent. Another hypoglycemia. Obviously, you all know that that's kind of the, the challenge these days, and Dr. Class will discuss that in, in, um, extensively. And decreasing sliding scale for use in skilled nursing. Best medications for elders uh, with uncontrolled diabetes on orals only. Fabulous. Okay, we'll keep those coming in and we're going to go ahead and proceed. Um, 
And Anne would like to just flat out learn how to avoid adverse events. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, moving on, <laughs> excuse me, if the screen wants to respond to me. Come on, you can do it, computer. It's acting like it's Monday. So again, this is a call to action addressing diabetes medications. Um, and Dr. Evan Klass is going to be presenting for us. He is um, pictured here. And uh, I'm just going to read his bio because it's quite extensive and he's got lots going on. So uh, he is a graduate of New York Medical College. He trained in internal medicine and was chief resident in internal medicine at Long Island Jewish Medical Center. He's also completed an endocrinology fellowship at George Washington University Medical Center and the VA Medical Center in Washington, D.C. So he practiced endocrinology in Long Island, New York for a while, and then he moved to Reno, where he joined the internal medicine faculty at the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine, where you can see he is still there. Um, he served as the interim chair of the internal medicine um, and then was appointed associate dean for statewide initiatives. Uh, currently, he serves as the Senior Associate Dean for Statewide Initiatives, and in 2011, he brought Project ECHO to Nevada, uh, recognizing its potential to impact the limited access of sub to subspecialty care in rural and underserved communities in Nevada. And those of us know what rural is in the states that we serve. Um, Nevada was the fourth replication of Project ECHO, and there are currently over 120 ECHO replications in the U.S. and 20 countries around the world. So he is the director of Project ECHO in Nevada, and he is the governor of the Nevada chapter of the American College of Physicians. So um, we want to thank Dr. Klass for being here and are really excited to hear this talk. We heard it during the dry run, and I, I am here to tell you that he's got lots of great information. So Dr. Klass, it's all you. And he may be muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Did that work? Yes, sir. We can. Okay. Jennifer, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I can see that there are 67 people on this call, which is uh, fabulous. And um, I'm appreciative of having the opportunity to present uh, to everyone today. Um, and I can see we have a little bit of temperature diversity in the group, although generally pretty cold everywhere uh, uh, in, our, in our region. Um, so I'm an endocrinologist, and I've been at it a pretty long time. Um, and you know, in medicine, we, if, you, if you're in it long enough, you see uh, pendulums swing from one extreme to another. And depending upon when you uh, join the party, um, the landscape might look one way or another. But when you've had the privilege of being involved for a long time, uh, you really do have an opportunity to um, see uh, how um, progress occurs. And it's not necessarily a straight line process. So, OK. I guess, so I have full control now, which is great. Um, I'm going to try to keep my remarks um, relatively uh, short, about 30 minutes perhaps, um, so that there is time to answer uh, everyone's questions. And I have no disclosures. I often say I wish I had disclosures, but I don't. Um, but in some way, it makes life easier this way. So. As I, after I was asked to give this presentation, um, this publication showed up in my mailbox at home, and you can see the circle date is November 2017. Obviously, this is a hot topic. Um, hypoglycemia in elderly patients, which is um, uh, hugely important, um, is seeing the light of day. And although we're going to talk about hypoglycemia in the elderly, we're going to talk about uh, hypoglycemia throughout um, uh, the ages. And the reason is that patients who get treated for diabetes end up with um, hypoglycemia risk, 
it may be greater, it may be lesser, but they all have it and we need to keep a focus on that. And obviously we're not the only ones now who are focusing on it. It has become a national uh, issue and is receiving attention. Um, this um, appeared in my, uh, as an email the other day, that the FDA is launching continuing education for providers to reduce hypoglycemic events. So this is on the radar um, across the country and at high levels of the federal government. Um, and reducing emergency department visits for insulin-induced hypoglycemia is a goal of the Help Healthy People 2020 initiative. It's important, and when these things become uh, goals, it's because they cause a lot of harm and they cost a lot of money. And the money is one thing, but it's the harm to patients that we are uh, most focused on reducing. So what did I, what do I hope to achieve in the course of this presentation? Well, uh, I want us to recognize how prevalent diabetes is in our population, and I don't think this will come as a surprise to anybody, um, and the prevalence is increasing. Um, and I want to just uh, cast some light on the numbers of patients who are on high-risk medications. Not all diabetes medicines have the same degree of risk profile. And obviously, when we're talking about risk, let's, I want to just make it clear, we're really talking today about the risk of inducing hypoglycemia. Okay, we're not talking about allergies to medicines. Um, we're talking about um, what is actually a predictable action of medications um, and identifying how uh, risk might be mitigated. We want to identify the risk factors or the factors that increase risk amongst seniors in particular and the importance of setting appropriate glycemic targets for seniors but for everyone. And we want to, I want to talk a little bit about something that I don't think gets enough attention which is the enormous opportunity posed by uh, patients being admitted to the hospital um, and the, the potential to intervene during those hospitalizations to uh, improve diabetes management once patients are discharged. So um, it's an important, not a, not a huge uh, piece of the puzzle, but I, I think there are real opportunities there. So 9.3% of the US population has diabetes, and as we know, 90% of those patients have type 2 diabetes. So if our population is around 340 million, we're talking about roughly 30 million patients with diabetes. Diabetes is listed as the seventh leading cause of death in the United States and in one way or another is responsible for 14 million emergency department visits per year. Here's a, here's, a, here's a problem. There are less than 5,000 practicing endocrinologists um, in the United States, and this is as of 2011. Um, I don't have updated numbers, but I will tell you based on my uh, awareness of what's going on in the endocrine uh, training world, that number is not appreciably different. So that equates to about one endocrinologist for every 6,000 patients with diabetes. Um, clearly, not every patient with diabetes can be seen and managed by an endocrinologist, and I'm here to tell you that they don't need to be seen and treated by endocrinologists, um, but it does mean that each of us as clinicians um, has to be willing and able uh, to manage most patients in our communities uh, with diabetes. So adverse drug events are very, are, are a substantial uh, cause of morbidity and mortality. Uh, paper from JAMA in 2016 reported um, about four emergency department visits per thousand people per year for adverse drug effects. This is not just in diabetes, but this is overall. That's an enormous uh, 
that's an enormous number uh, when we consider um, the uh, that the danger posed by these events and by the burden placed on emergency departments of treating patients uh, with adverse drug events. 27%, a quarter of those, so roughly one person per thousand per year ends up hospital ends up hospitalized because of an adverse drug effect. And 35% of those ER visits occurred in seniors. So you can see that um, this is an enormous issue for seniors and multiple interventions have been devised to try to identify um, how, uh, which medicines or types or classes of medicines are particularly problematic and how to try to uh, reduce the, um, uh, the risk of adverse drug effects in seniors. Now, of the 15 most common causes of emergency visits for adverse drug events, five are diabetes medicines, five out of 15. So that is really an impressive number. And they were insulin, metformin, glipizide, gliburide, and glimepiride. Okay, so insulin and our three commonly prescribed sulfonylurea medicines, um, which we all know have the capacity to drive blood sugars to, uh, to low levels, and metformin, which taken by itself, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, does not induce hypoglycemia, except under very rare circumstances but when used in combination, as it often is, can uh, contribute to hypoglycemia risk. Most of you probably have heard of the Beers classification. And the Beers classification is, uh, is a tool that was created in the 90s as a way of um, looking at medicines that pose particular hazards to those uh, over the age of 65. And the categories are um, uh, kind of funny, but the category that is most um, important uh, describes medicines that should always be avoided uh, in seniors. But it's interesting that of those medicines that are listed as always avoid, uh, only a small number actually uh, contribute to um, ER visits. Most ER visits are for med medicines that aren't and can't be on the always avoid list because they are essential modes of treatment for a variety of serious medical illnesses. So we could not advise patients over the age of 65 to always avoid anticoagulants, nor could we always avoid them to uh, uh, always advise them to avoid opioids, nor can we always advise them to avoid anti-hyperglycemic medicines. We know that those medicines are essential to treat um, uh, serious illnesses. But on the beers list of always avoid in the most recent iteration, which was published in 2015, the use of short-acting insulin for um, uh, for um, acute interventions, um, for sliding scale use, and somebody mentioned that as a concern in skilled nursing facilities, the use of sliding scales is now listed as an always avoid uh, in the beers criteria. And the other in the beers criteria is the, our long acting sulfonylureas. So particularly mentioned is gliburide, um, and glimepiride. So these medicines um, are advised to be avoided because of their uh, avoided because of their potential to cause hypoglycemia. So let's do a bit of history because I think that always helps us to understand um, the dilemma. So how did we get here? Well, it all started uh, with a physician from Belgium named Jean Perrard, who published in 1978 in the first volume of Diabetes Care our go-to journal for diabetes management, um, his personal observations of over 4,000 patients that he treated personally over many years, and he assessed his, uh, their degree of glycemic control 
and their risk of complications. Now, remember, he did this without the benefit of the tools that we count on today for determining glycemic control, but this was his perception of his own patients, and he was able to correlate risk of diabetic micro complications, microvascular complications like neuropathy and retinopathy with his perceived um, uh, glycemic control indicators. Prior to this, there was really no consensus on causality of complications. There were two schools of thought in the United States, one that control did matter, and the other that complications were caused by a process entirely separate from hyperglycemia. But Perart really changed the way we looked at this and added impetus to um, working on improving control to prevent complications. And then tools became available that allowed this to actually happen, right? In the early 80s, we began to use finger stick glucose monitoring. May, some of you may remember the Ames dextrometer, took up half your desk and took a minute or so to give a reading, uh, was reasonably accurate. We then moved on to uh, color uh, test strips, uh, chem sticks that became available were pretty good. And, as a, and obviously over time, these tools have gotten much better. Remember that before the early 80s, hemoglobin A1C was not available. Now we take it for granted and it's our method of determining whether patients are under good control. As it became uh, commonplace, our ability to uh, understand how our patients were doing became much better. And then we developed new delivery systems, pumps and pens, which don't really change therapy particularly, but improved patient uh, compliance and acceptance became prevalent. And we've had a whole host of new medicines, as you're aware of, some of which are uh, fundamentally game changers in diabetes management, and some which are just small incremental changes from therapies we've had before. And obviously, when there are lots of new drugs, there is lots of uh, big pharma engagement, um, and that changes the landscape a little bit. So we also got here because of two landmark studies, and these studies should not be um, uh, undervalued in terms of the impact that they've had on our understanding of diabetes over the course of years. This was great science, and these were two enormous studies, the Diabetes Control and Complication trial, which wrapped up in 1993, and the United Kingdom uh, Prospective Diabetes Study, which, in, which wrapped up uh, in about 2000. Some of you may even remember uh, this lead article in the New England Journal from September 30th, 1993. This changed my life. As an endocrinologist, the report of this paper entirely changed my approach to managing patients with type 1 diabetes. What did it show? Well, it showed, first of all, that one could achieve tight glycemic control, right? So that we could um, actually drive patients average, uh, drive patients A1Cs to a mean of 7.2, and this is thousands and thousands of patients. Um, that was the intensive therapy group compared with the conventional control group with, who had a mean A1C of 9.1. And this study was then extended over many years. Um, and I don't want you to focus on this, but this was the control achieved in follow-up of patients after completion of the DCCT. Now, the, the UK PDS study looked at about 5,000 patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes in the United Kingdom. And there were multiple papers that were published as a result of this study looking at multiple endpoints and multiple different uh, treatment regimens um, that all essentially showed uh, common findings. So what did we learn? Well, the DCCT proved that microvascular complications correlated with hemoglobin A1C and type 1 diabetes. It, this was irrefutable, and this was, um, as I said, a game changer in our uh, approach to treating patients with type 1 diabetes. Achieving tight glycemic control very um, immediately became the standard of care, and we assessed 
physician's quality of care, basically, ba based upon how close to uh, normalizing patients' hemoglobin A1Cs they were able to do. In the UK PDS, similar findings uh, were demonstrated with respect to type 2 diabetes. And the question became, how low is low enough? Is a hemoglobin A1C of 7 good enough? And this is, this is uh, a cartoonish plot from the DCCT study demonstrating that as we move to the left, as hemoglobin A1Cs drop from 12 to 9 to 7, the risk of microvascular complications, be it retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, or microalbumin, microalbuminuria, all decline. Okay, and here you can look at relative risk so that a relative risk of one is background, that would be the risk in non-diabetic patients, you can see that as hemoglobin A1Cs get closer and closer to six, the relative risk gets lower. And that was our mantra. Our goal was push the A1C down using the available tools that we had. But what was the corollary of that? Well, the corollary of that was that as we pushed A1Cs downwards, hypoglycemia started to really track upwards. And for each percentage reduction in hemoglobin A1C, hypoglycemia risk increased. But you can see there's also a bit of a break point. As we get down below eight, the rate of rise of, hemo of hypoglycemia episodes increases. And we're not talking about mild um, adrenergic symptoms. We're not talking about a little bit of tremor or a little bit of sweating. We're talking about severe hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia significant enough to impact cognitive function. And look at these numbers, right? This, this is the rate per 100 patients per year. So at A1Cs down in the six to seven range, we're looking at 80 hypoglycemia events per 100 patients uh, per year. So this is really, really common. And I will tell you that we minimized the impact of that for a long time because we were so fixated on reducing microvascular risk. This is a recent paper from JAMA Internal Medicine looking at hypoglycemia risk with um, in terms of patient's degree of complexity. And by complexity, we're looking at sort of a, uh, uh, an aggregated uh, risk profile that includes age, uh, comorbidities, multiple medications. And what I wanted to demonstrate for you here is that as patients become more and more complex, if we try to maintain intensive treatment, that is lowering uh, A1Cs, to a low number, let's say six and a half or seven, the risk of, of hypoglycemia goes up dramatically, um, even threefold, uh, so that we need to be cognizant of our patient, right? We, it, this, is a not, this is not one size fits all. Um, we can be aggressive in treating blood glucose levels in some patients, and in others, we need to be very aware of the potential hazards. So uh, this is an interesting curve from another paper from JAMA Internal Medicine 2014 that looked at um, hospital admissions for patients with diabetes. And this is so interesting, right? Because back here in the 90s, and we don't have older data, but I, I think this was probably pretty flat, patients tended to be admitted for uh, hyperglycemia, right? Well, that was what we used to see. We used to see patients show up in the emergency department um, with very high blood sugars and were admitted. Now, I will say there's a little bit of a confounder there because we used to admit patients to the hospital. Um, patients with blood sugars of 250 or 300 or 350 would often be admitted to the hospital to improve their glycemic control. Clearly, our pattern of hospital admission has changed. That may, that may contribute to some of this decline. But the more important issue is the emergence of hypoglycemia as a cause of hospital admission. 
And even though this has tailed off a little bit, this is still um, a, an area of great concern, and it's a much more common uh, cause of hospital admission than hyperglycemia. This is a very important study. Uh, this was the ACCORD trial, which appeared in the New England Journal in 2008, and I think was probably the single most important study that caused us to rethink our approach to uh, patient management. One of the great unanswered questions was, um, we were confident that glycemic control could prevent diabetic microangiopathy. It was not quite so clear what the impact of tight glycemic control on uh, large vessel atherosclerosis was. That is, on the risk of myocardial infarction, uh, coronary heart disease, and stroke. Well, the ACCORD study uh, was done to look at patients who were at high risk for coronary events or stroke. And these were patients who had already had a coronary event or had a high risk profile. And they were treated uh, with intensive glycemic control or conventional therapy. And what emerged from this study and actually caused the study to be terminated prematurely was what you see on the right side, because there were two uh, phases to this study. One was the occurrence of coronary events or stroke or cardiovascular death. The other was death from any cause. And although there appears to be some separation in terms of the primary outcomes in patients who were followed for a long time, um, although this was a very small number of patients in the early years of the study, there were really no differences, but there was a very important difference um, in death from any cause. And you can see that right about here at the three and a half year mark, and then continuing, there's a clear separation between uh, death from any cause in the patients with intensive therapy versus standard therapy. And for the worse, in other words, patients on intensive therapy to lower blood sugars and lower A1C ended up having increased risk of death. And that prompted the investigators to terminate the study and I think caused us in the endocrine world to rethink our degree of uh, aggressiveness in glycemic, uh, in our pursuit of tight glycemic control. And this is just the uh, um, hazard ratio uh, that showed that um, that standard therapy was preferable in patients um, who um, had previous uh, cardiovascular events, um, who didn't have previous cardiovascular events, but standard therapy clearly uh, uh, was safer. I wanted to just show you a couple of other slides that look at hypoglycemia risk um, in patients on insulin and uh, the frequency with which uh, hospital uh, emergency visits and hospitalizations occur. So what you find is that things that are common are common. So that hypoglycemia in insulin treated patients is most common in patients on one insulin product. That's because most patients are on one insulin product. But when patients are on two insulin products, uh, the risk of hypoglycemia um, persists. In combinations, uh, metformin appears as a common uh, uh, association with hypoglycemia. But again, I believe this is because of the frequency with which uh, metformin is used as an adjunct in patients on insulin therapy. But here's the important thing, that patients on insulin who use sulfonylureas have a higher risk of hypoglycemia than do patients who are on other classes of drugs, including um, uh, GLP-1 analogs, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, thiazolidine dienes. So that there are combinations of therapy that we need to be more concerned about. And the one that I wanted to highlight here for you is um, the use of sulfonylureas in combination with insulin uh, uh, posing a significant uh, hazard. 
I wanted to show you this algorithm, uh, not because I want to go through it in any detail, but just to demonstrate for you the complexity uh, of uh, treatment of patients with type 2 uh, diabetes these days and the stress that I think all of us clinicians are under to try to make sense of this vast array of medication uh, classes and to try to create uh, treatment strategies that are um, safe and effective for our patients. But the important thing here are uh, the targets, right? So patients who um, present to us with A1Cs of seven and a half or less um, should be considered for monotherapy only. But I would tell you that one should be cautious about instituting therapy uh, in all patients based on A1Cs um, because the safety of these medicines um, needs to be considered. But you can see that certainly in this category of medication, um, safety of sulfonylureas needs to be really be considered because we run the risk of hypoglycemia. But what concerns me always about these algorithms is the push to continually advance therapy at short intervals. So if we have not achieved goal in three months, move on to double therapy. And as we add new agents, the risks of hypoglycemia increase. And I always think that before we add another medicine, we really need to think about our, uh, our goals of therapy. And we also need to think about whether the patient has really embraced their treatment regimen and has really uh, attempted to get the most mileage out of uh, our lower level modes of therapy. So here's the, and this is the one that is particularly uh, interesting and important, I think. We all know, I hope, that metformin is our most important agent in treating type 2 diabetes. Um, metformin can be safely used um, with estimated glomerular filtration rates as low as 30. Um, however, we want to be careful in patients with advanced heart failure or COPD uh, because of uh, uh, their tissue hypoxia, which metformin may, uh, uh, in which case metformin may increase risk of lactic acidosis. Um, we also know that metformin can cause GI upset in a, a significant percentage of patients, perhaps 10 to 20 percent of patients. But this study looked at patients' use of metformin and the frequency with which medications were added um, without metformin use being optimized. Remember, metformin it by itself will not cause hypoglycemia. It can lower hemoglobin A1C by 1%. Um, and it has a remarkable overall safety profile. It's a great medicine to be used in combination. Um, but many patients end up not taking it. So this study looked at how often um, second line medication was added without ensuring that metformin was actually being used as, it's, as it was prescribed. And it looked like uh, only less than 10% of patients had evidence of using metformin as recommended before a second line agent was added. This is a huge problem because this up migration uh, subjects patients to medicines with higher hypoglycemia risk. And when I talk about using metformin, and I think this is really important, one needs to recognize that we don't want to touch, try to titrate metformin dose to blood glucose. We want to recognize that metformin is working on the patient's intrinsic insulin resistance and because it will not cause hypoglycemia, the goal should really be to optimize the dose. Um, to me, that means a full dose ought to be in the range of 2,000 milligrams a day. And since I know that no patient will take medicines three times a day, I tend to want to treat my patients with 1,000 milligrams of metformin BID unless there's some reason why they can't tolerate it. Extended release medications can be used 
My experience has been that 1,000 BID is tolerable for most patients. Remember, they ought to take it with their food. But before you consider metformin to have failed, you really want to ensure that the patient has been taking it as you think they've been taking it. And you want to be sure that you have actually prescribed it in a way where it's most likely to work, which is at, um, at, full, at full dose. So why do patients get hypoglycemic? Well, they, for lots of reasons, and it's partly what we do, it's partly what they do. So this just lists some of the, some of the things that happens, and it also demonstrates that um, some of the things we most fear are not all that common, right? So most common cause of hypoglycemia, I love this term, a meal-related misadventure, which usually means missing a meal, um, and the patient um, becoming hypoglycemic. That's not an adverse effect in the sense that there was anything wrong with the medicine. It's just that the medicine was doing what it was designed to do, but not being buffered by adequate uh, food intake. There are the usual things. Patient took the wrong insulin product. You know, that is really a problem. Um, we're not using NPH. Now all of our insulins are clear. Patients are often using pens. It's not rare for them to pick up and inject the wrong pen. Patients taking short-acting insulin at bedtime instead of uh, basal insulin at bedtime by mistake happens fairly commonly. Um, so again, an adverse effect only because the medicine is doing what it was designed to do, but under uh, circumstances that put the patient at risk. Patients take the wrong dose, happens all the time. Um, patients taking an additional dose. Um, we get stacking of insulin because patients um, either get worried that their blood sugars are not coming down, um, they feel they're not sure whether they took their medicine and take an additional dose. Uh, all of these things happen. Pump-related misadventures, not all that common. Patients who are on pumps tend to uh, do a very good job of managing um, uh, uh, their pump therapy. What about seniors? Well, 25% of those over 65 have diabetes. And of course, these are our most complicated patients. There are multiple comorbidities. They've got coronary disease, hypertension. Um, they may have um, uh, early onset dementia. There are a whole host of comorbidities, all of which uh, impact their ability for self-care. Uh, but also cause them to be on very complex medication regimens. And that sets us up for drug-drug interactions, but also for errors in patient uh, therapy. As we said, patients may be on multiple medicines. And the risks of emergency department visits for hypoglycemia um, are twice as high for those over 80s, over 80, and the risk of hospitalization is five times greater in that age group. So patients over 80 are at enormous risk for ending up in the emergency department. If they end up in the emergency department, their probability of being admitted is higher. And as we know, once patients are admitted to the hospital, a whole cascade of events often follows um, with, with not a pretty outcome. I view hypoglycemia as getting hit over the head. And each one of these um, assaults on our uh, cerebral cortex has an impact, and that impact tends to be additive. So that patients with recurrent hypoglycemia that is significant enough to cause neuroglycopenia um, are at risk for losing cognitive function permanently. Um, I love this image. But the image that I always have in my head is that getting, getting severely hypoglycemic is like being hit with a two by four. And the consequences of hypoglycemia cannot be trivialized. We know that patients with recurrent hypoglycemia have increased risk of dementia. They may fall. If they fall, they may fracture because they're already frail and old. Um, they may have a cardiovascular event, a myocardial infarction or stroke. Their quality of life is diminished because of the fear that comes from uh, becoming hypoglycemic and uh, efforts that are required and the vigilance that's required to try to prevent it. This is really quite 
an impingement on our patients' uh, enjoyment of living. And patients may die with hypoglycemia. So this is, uh, it's obviously very important. This is just to demonstrate the difference in hypoglycemia risk in patients as they get older. And I just wanted to show you two panels in the 65 to 74 age group, hospitalizations for hypoglycemia down here about 100 per 100,000. But as patients get older, uh, hypoglycemia as a cause for hospital admissions increases. So let's talk about our hemoglobin A1C targets. And these are based on the American Diabetes Association uh, um, guidelines for treatment. And the ADA recommends for non-pregnant adults an A1C under 7%, okay? That's an aggressive target. For selected patients, um, an A1C of 6.5% or less is still advised. Now let's put that in some context, right? Those may be our younger patients with type one diabetes who may be super confident and comfortable with glycemic management and may be using insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring they may be capable of safely achieving these very tight glycemic targets. And for these patients, the avoidance of, hype, of, of risk of microvascular complications is exceedingly important. The other category of patients where, whom, whereby, where this may be appropriate are in patients with type 2 diabetes who are on lifestyle modification only. They are not at risk for hypoglycemia, nor are those with met, on metformin only. And it may be reasonable to, uh, to determine that an A1C less than 6.5 is appropriate. However, that's not, a, that's not a very large segment of our patient population. For patients who have severe hypoglycemia or who have advanced complications, we need to roll our targets back and perhaps set a threshold of 8% or less uh, for those patients with the notion that avoidance of hypoglycemia is most important. And the other recognition here is that once microvascular complications are present, lowering blood sugars will not reverse them or necessarily improve them. So we will not make neuropathy better by aggressively lowering A1C in a patient with established neuropathy nor will we do that with a patient with established retinopathy. So we need to recognize that in a patient who's developed complications, the horse is out of the barn, and we now need to look at other endpoints for uh, appropriate management. And finally, the ADA recommends that for many seniors, we wanna relax their glycemic targets to prevent symptomatic hypoglycemia, but and actually that's a typo because what I meant to say was that we want to prevent, we want their control tight enough that they're not symptomatically hyperglycemic, that they are not suffering with polyuria, polydipsia, et cetera. We want them on enough treatment to prevent those symptoms, but not induce hypoglycemia. So at hospitalization, Hi. yes. Um, we are, we have about nine minutes left. Okay. So I do want to, make sure you have time to cover these last couple slides for the recommendations, but you might have to talk a little fast. All right, that's, that is my nature. I just, you know, I talk too much and I apologize. Let me just tell you um, this about hospitalization. Patients admitted to the hospital ought to be reassessed when they come in. Um, ideally with a diabetes education team that looks at their prior therapy, their A1C at the time they get admitted to the hospital, and for the construction of a management plan that will um, improve their glycemic control in the future. We want to engage caregivers. We want to use um, medications appropriately. This is an opportunity to reassess patients' glycemic control going forward and to ensure that we've considered all of the important uh, risk factors for them. And we want to use their admission hemoglobin A1C as a rate, as a way of stratifying um, their management um, as they go forward, and so that we can discharge them from the hospital, um, feeling comfortable that they will be able to achieve an appropriate level of glycemic control and perhaps improve 
uh, poorly controlled diabetes. And there's good evidence that this can be done as long as we assure that patients have access to post-discharge um, care. And that may be a hotline with nurses, or it may be by ensuring that these patients have follow-up visits. And just to close, this is just to show you that, there, that the future may be in utilizing big data and artificial intelligence to identify patients who are at higher risk uh, of developing hypoglycemia and ending up in the emergency department. And this is something that was developed at Kaiser that looks at um, material that's embedded in the electronic medical record and can select out patients based on a very small number of variables who have been, who are, uh, that have been identified as being predictors. And when this has been looked at, these predictors turn out to be very reliable in terms of uh, uh, being sensitive to hypoglycemia risk. And just to summarize then, hypoglycemia has surpassed hyperglycemia as a cause of uh, visits to the ER and the hospital. That our A1C targets may have been overly aggressive for many of our patients, including and most particularly in seniors that patient and prescriber errors are major contributors to this problem, and that hypoglycemia risk is exaggerated in the elderly and consequences may be severe. And with that, I'll stop, and I'm sorry to have run over, but I will be happy to answer any questions that we can. Thank you so much for the information. Um, we did have a couple questions. One, I believe, uh, got answered. The question that is in chat is, um, do you recommend Victoza or any GLP-1 to be given alone without metformin? Well, that's a great question. I love GLP-1 uh, uh, analogs. I think that they are, um, since metformin, they're probably the most important class of medicine that has become available. And I will tell you that we use GLP-1 analogs sometimes as adjuncts for weight management. Um, I tend to prefer initializing therapy with metformin, but knowing that some of those patients will not tolerate it, I would use a GLP-1 in the absence of metformin if uh, they couldn't tolerate the metformin. Uh, but in general, I like to use it in combination. Great. Um... We also had another question. Uh, do you recommend sliding scale or carb counting? Ah, we never recommend sliding scale. Um, we always want patients to be familiar with carb counting and that they are uh, determining, and I'm I guess we're talking about patients with, um, uh, who are on a basal bolus uh, mode of insulin therapy, we want them to be able to calculate their prandial insulin dose based on their blood glucose at the time and their anticipated carbohydrate intake, or if they're on kind of a standard diet, that they are using a fairly standard insulin to carb ratio. Great. The only other question you actually answered, it was asked and then you went right into it regarding um, the likelihood of exacerbation of dementia. So. Um, Audrey asked that question, and just a moment later, you started talking about that and um, answered her question. So I don't see any other questions. I would um, maybe ask for those that are uh, maybe in skilled nursing or other that are not hospital-based, what sorts of recommendations would you give them? Because I know I think it's a great idea, this um, reviewing their medications when they're in the hospital, but if that doesn't happen, um, is that something you might recommend that the skilled nursing facility could take on? And how would you suggest they go about that? Sure. I think skilled nursing facilities have a great opportunity for um, re reimagining the blood sugar control of their residents. Um, again, that group of patients um, has... Uh, suffers greatly when they get hypoglycemia. So to, in my mind, avoidance of, of hypoglycemia in that group is terribly, terribly important. Reassessing the patient's um, uh, medication profile, incredibly important. Those patients, uh, we certainly don't want them on long-acting sulfonylureas in, in a skilled nursing facility. We know that those patients may have uh, unpredictable uh, food intake, 
we just don't want those long acting beds on board. Um, and we want to try to simplify the regimens for those patients. And again, we certainly, and this is a beer's uh, uh, target, sliding scales should not be used in those institutions because um, it, it's sort of the worst approach one can take because um, we are uh, allowing blood sugars to run all over the map. We are hammering them when they're high. We're holding off on treatment when they're low and patients tend to end up on quite a roller coaster um, with risks on both the high and low end. Great. Um, really quickly, there's another uh, question, but I want to just mention that we do have an evaluation. We're going to post that link in chat um, just in case we run a little over. Um, but uh, thank you all for attending, and we'll continue to answer some questions here while we have Dr. Class. Uh, and then again, this, as I mentioned, this recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, so uh, probably within the next week or so. Um, so please feel free to check that out. So, Dr. Class, another question from uh, Looks Like Skilled Nursing is most of our patients who come from the acute hospital have sliding scales ordered. How do we take them off, especially if they were never on a sliding scale prior to acute hospitalization? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> my, my condolences here. Uh, this is really, really challenging. So, um, those patients need to, we want, the goal here, I think, should be to have the patient on an insulin regimen that narrows their range of glycemic excursions. Now, granted, there are going to be scenarios where there's an acute event and blood glucose levels um, are out of whack and a stat dose of short-acting insulin is required. But by and large, um, the, the routine of a skilled nursing facility should be fairly predictable so that we can organize, if it's a patient on um, a basal bolus, that their basal insulin dose is adjusted so that their fasting or morning blood sugar levels is in an acceptable level, and that we are able to construct a mealtime insulin regimen um, based on you know standard insulin dosing that uh, takes into consideration what the patient's blood sugar is plus what their carb intake is going to be and we create a prandial dose and that ideally will prevent um, surges um, and, and falls in blood sugar. Now for patients who are not on a basal bolus insulin regimen perhaps, maybe they're on orals. Well, if they are on orals and blood sugar levels are so variable that we're uncomfortable with, uh, with them and we want to add some insulin, then we need to rethink their entire regimen because there's clearly something wrong there because patients in a stable environment who are not acutely ill should not have blood sugars that are bouncing around so much. Fabulous. So a couple more questions. Are you okay to stay for a few minutes and we'll keep recording yes. to share this? Okay. Um, so uh, Audrey asks, is there a causative risk for dementia with diabetes? Well, um, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but I think I do. So um, is diabetes in and of itself a cause of dementia? Well, Diabetes is a disease that affects small blood vessels uh, to the extent that small blood vessels in the brain can be affected. There is risk, but I believe that the, it's, the intrinsic risk of diabetes and dementia is not substantial. However, um, hypoglycemia will increase the risk. Great. And then one last question. Uh, most of my patients are post-discharge care management. What would be the most important teaching tool that you would recommend to avoid readmissions? Mm. So the key to avoiding readmission is discharging the patient on a regimen that they understand, that they're capable of complying with, you know, that takes it into consideration um, their, um, uh, their understanding of their illness, their understanding of the medications, the importance of regular uh, food intake, um, and that the regimen is appropriate to their disease. 
So I, I do believe that the opportunity to, for the avoidance of readmission comes with the initial admission. And I think that discharge planning starts at the moment of admission. Um, that the, as soon as a patient with diabetes hits the hospital, we ought to know what their pre-hospitalization control was like based on their A1C and take a look at their regimen, determine if it's appropriate, by which I mean that their control was adequate, um, and if not, revamp it before the patient is discharged. I think that we are, we're all under pressure to get patients out quickly, um, but sometimes diabetes management uh, is complex enough and the risk of readmission high enough that um, slowing down just a bit might be warranted. And then, of course, having access to some outpatient follow-up, that there be some connection point that patients can uh, uh, can reach to ask the questions that, you know, un invariably will occur. Great. Um, you know, the other thing I would mention, and you are probably fully aware of, is that in each of our four states, so Oregon, Utah, Nevada, and New Mexico, we are also helping to promote the diabetes self-management classes, the peer taught classes. Um, yes. And I would imagine that those also along with exactly what you said, making sure people can understand and, and manage what you've given them to do, but also those classes are really good. Um, and all of that information, for those of you that aren't familiar with those classes, are, is on our website at healthinsight.org. You can um, look up information about those, and there should be a contact list at a state contact for each of, those, um, each of our states to help you connect with some of those classes. So we actually do run a program up here in Reno, and I will tell you that it is undersubscribed. We're always trying to recruit more patients. We would love, I think it's a fabulous program. We would love to have more participation. And I would echo that across all of our states. I believe that that's a challenge. It's a really good class, but um, there's, it's difficult to get people in. Once they attend the first class, they seem to be like, oh, yes, I'm good for this. I'm going to stay. Um, but when you tell them it's a six-week class, they kind of... Right. <laughs> But as soon as they attend, they're like, I should, I should have done that long ago. Absolutely. They should have done it right at the get-go. Yeah. So I want to thank you again, Doctor, for your time. This was a great webinar. Um, we are a little over, but um, like I said, this is recorded, so we'll post it. Uh, Audrey, who asked the question about the diabetes um, and Alzheimer's connection, dementia connection, said yes. You answered exactly what she was asking. So... Um, oh. Thank you so very much for your time, and um, I'm going to go ahead and end this webinar and let everybody get on with their day. Jennifer, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thanks, everybody.